Hey everybody, welcome to OK Talks. I'm your host, Oliver Kendall. I'm a lifelong political nerd with an academic background in international relations focus and security policy and real world experience working in the US domestic political space and living in a number of other countries than my own. All of which combined, I think, positions me fairly well both to interpret for my international audience what's going on in the politics of my own country and to shed light for some of the folks back home on some events of note going on in the rest of the world. I've been struggling to think how to do an episode responding to the terrorist attacks in Israel over this past weekend. Uh, like, on the one hand, I just feel like I can't possibly find the right thing to say. And then on the other hand, you know, my academic background focused heavily in this, in security, and, and, and I was a TA for like a couple of years specifically in a class about Middle East security policy under my friend and mentor, Professor Andrew Latham. If you're listening, thanks, Professor, by the way, best job I ever had. You know, short and sweet has <laughs> has never really been my forte. And, and on this subject, it just feels like there's way too much information to be able to organize into a narrative that flows rationally from one point to the next over half an hour or so, as I usually try to on this show. Furthermore, things have been developing super quickly, and, and like, I've got friends deploying right now. Uh, Omri Lavi, who uh, was on this show just a couple of months back, criticizing, you know, the creepy, undemocratic moves uh, by the Israeli government under Netanyahu earlier this summer. Omri, he, he, he's a colonel, I believe, in the IDF. He's, he's in it now. Also, I've, I've got at least one Arab-Israeli friend who's living in Israel proper who's terrified right now because, well, for one thing, she's well within range of rockets and potential terrorist infiltrators who would kill her on sight. And for another, she's also extremely worried, you know, not totally without cause, about potential backlash from other Israelis. All of which is to say, I've spent a few days trying and just failing to organize my thoughts into a coherent episode, as I hope most of my others are. And you know what the hell with it? I give up. Instead of trying to put together a narrative that flows logically, I'm just going to sort of cobble together a couple of things here. There are one or two points that I want to make right off the bat. Then there are a couple of really smart takes from other folks that I've seen over the last couple of days that I want to just put in front of you all. And then finally, I figured I'd just kind of build the rest of this episode off of answering some questions I've been getting over the last couple of days, uh, some from folks in the audience. I figure at the end of the day, you know, rather than trying to cram everything that I'm thinking and feeling in here and try to make it somehow cohere, I'll just do my best to answer a couple of those questions that I've gotten. Hope it works out. If it does, I should say, please do remember to subscribe to OK Talks on whatever platform you listen. Shoot me an email at OKTalksPodcast at gmail.com to join the emailing list, and be sure to share the show with anybody else you think might get something out of it. So just to quickly sort of say what happened, in case any of my audience has been living under a rock, early in the morning on Saturday, October 7th, Hamas, the jihadist organization that controls the Gaza Strip, which is one of the two territories that would form a potential Palestinian state, launched a coordinated attack which appears to have been aimed entirely at killing Israeli civilians, which they did with great success and enthusiasm. At the time I'm recording this, the number of civilians Hamas murdered stands at somewhere around 1,300. Now, it's important to note here the, the deliberately sociopathic nature of this attack, because the body count, although obviously horrific, doesn't on its own nearly show, I guess, the totality of just how horrifying this was. I mean, detonating a suicide vest in a crowd, flying a plane into a building full of people, you know, those are terrible too. But these Hamas terrorists, I mean, included in the attack were things like shooting a bunch of unarmed kids at a music festival in the back as they ran away, kidnapping elderly Holocaust survivors, parading young girls through the streets of Gaza City while blood, like, runs down their legs filming themselves while they kill entire families, decapitating infants or burning them alive. Seriously, there are images of all of this readily available. I mean, the Israeli government yesterday released the news that 40 infants had been murdered in one kibbutz, and a bunch of people accused them of lying, so they published the photos. All of which is to say, the body count on its own is terrible, but as President Biden put it, the pure, unadulterated evil of this attack just casually like on film, brings to mind the worst rampages of ISIS. This brings me to one point that I want to make off the top here, which is that I've been seeing a bunch of bad coverage of Hamas since the or maybe I should say like sanitized coverage, like insisting on calling Hamas a militant group or fighters or something, or implying that 
It's some sort of legitimate representative of the Palestinian people rather than what it is, a terrorist organization that brutally oppresses Palestinians just as it attacks Israelis. I've seen legitimate news coverage, not to mention you know, shameful internet terrorism apologists, sometimes frame this attack as somehow like a tit-for-tat a tit military strike or resistance or something. But it's not. If you think engaging in mass rape and kidnapping children is legitimately part of the job of being a resistance fighter or a soldier, well, you've clearly never been a resistance fighter or a soldier. Well, based on the last year and a half, unfortunately, maybe a Russian soldier, but you see my point. As weird as it sounds, violence, like just about everything else in life, exists on a spectrum. Like, yes, all violence is bad. But some kinds of violence are more bad than other kinds of violence. And what happened in Israel last week was not warfare. It was worse. It was terrorism. It was extermination. I mean, civilian casualties tragically virtually always occur in warfare. But there, there is a legitimate moral difference between a situation in which civilian casualties are an unintended consequence, or maybe it would be more realistic to say a tragic byproduct of an attack, and a situation in which civilian casualties were the entire point of an attack. Now, my guess is that some of this, like, sanitized coverage of Hamas and their attack, and probably at least some of the weird sort of excuse-making for the attack, is coming from a place of worrying that doing anything other than that somehow, like, undermines the totally legitimate aspiration among Palestinians for some sort of independent state. But ultimately, I feel like that rationale is actually pretty insulting to regular Palestinians, a decent number of whom definitely are not supportive of Hamas and are, in fact, Hamas's primary victims. I'd like to think that, given the chance, most average Palestinians probably would not choose to machine gun entire families or a bunch of unarmed concertgoers. Certainly none of the Palestinians I've ever met would. Speaking of the Palestinians, it needs to be said here, yes, the Palestinians do have legitimate grievances, some grounded in the chaos around Israel's original founding, some stemming from the occupation resulting from the Six-Day War in 1967, you know, Israeli settlements, which, yes, do complicate the possibility of an eventual lasting peace between Israel and the Palestinians, and yes, all of this has been made substantially worse by the truly atrocious leadership of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, as Omri Lavi discusses back in episode 37 of this show. There is plenty more that can be said about all of those things that I mentioned and more. But none of that justifies the sort of sociopathic violence deliberately targeted at civilians that we saw last weekend. You can support a better future for the Palestinians, including an independent state, as I do without celebrating atrocity, and, I should add, without responding to an atrocity by simply mentioning those grievances as though they somehow justify it. Further, those things I just mentioned and many of the issues the Palestinian people are confronting, well, a lot of them aren't really in Israel's power to just solve unilaterally. As I've gotten into debates over the last couple of days with people who <laughs> are inclined to find some way in which Israel is responsible for the Hamas murder of their civilians, I've sometimes asked, Okay, what would you suggest that Israel, on its own, do differently? Well, end the occupation, some have said to me. Okay, in principle, yes, that should absolutely be the end goal overall vis-a-vis -vis a Palestinian state. But Israel hasn't actually occupied Gaza since 2005. Okay then, say others who already knew that, lift the blockade of Gaza. Okay, but we just saw what happened even with a giant fence there, so... At that point, besides just half-heartedly suggesting that Israel not respond to rocket attacks, well, as long as Hamas controls Gaza, there aren't a lot of good answers for what Israel could do on its own to improve the situation, at least on the Gaza side of the Israel-Palestine equation. <laughs> well, to be fair, I have gotten into fights with a couple of people who do have an answer, some version of, Israel should disappear and the Jews should go away. But, you know, I'm going to go ahead and not add a second holocaust to the list of possible solutions Israel could pursue. It's reasonable, it's moral to want a better life for the Palestinians, particularly the ones living in Gaza, where the situation is nothing short of appalling. I mean, the open-air prison thing? That's true. And worse, it's an open-air prison where the guards on the inside are jihadists who confiscate most of the humanitarian aid that comes in in order to repurpose it into weaponry and then use the ordinary people as human shields when they attack. And it's understandable why people who don't know that much about the situation, especially my fellow liberals, would look to Israel as obviously more powerful than the Palestinians and be like, Jesus, guys, how could you let this happen? But realistically, looking only at the Israelis to fix this unilaterally somehow isn't viable. 
in response to the idea that Israel should simply stand down, like not respond, basically just take it from Hamas because Israel is so much more powerful than Hamas is, I saw one particularly good take on Twitter from a guy named Jacob Levy. Here's Jacob. There's an understandable liberal instinct to analyze conflict by identifying the underdog. Which side has higher casualties? Who is weaker? This is close, but not quite right. The more morally revealing question is, which side would be weaker if they laid down their weapons? If Russia laid down their weapons, there would be peace. If Ukraine did, there'd be no Ukraine. If Hamas laid down their weapons, there'd be peace. If Israel laid down their weapons, there would be no Israel. Now, many would argue, for good reason, that Hamas simply disappearing, or even more unthinkably, renouncing violence, won't on its own ensure peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians. But it sure would make it a lot more viable. Having started bringing in those other takes that I mentioned at the top, I now want to bring in a rather longer one from Ali Rizvi, a Pakistani-Canadian physician who wrote the book The Atheist Muslim. Uh, Ali is always a great source of analysis on issues around Islamic extremism, the Middle East, etc. I asked him on Twitter if he was cool with me straight up stealing his entire thread because I think it's perfect. In the end, I don't think we need to hear the entire thing verbatim, uh, although I will link to it in the description and suggest that anyone who's curious read the whole thing. You should. Uh, so parts of what Ali's written I will summarize, and parts I'll just quote outright. One big takeaway from the thread is a number of ways in which the leadership on both sides of this conflict are not doing right by the people they're actually supposed to be representing. So in a few different ways, Ali lays out where Hamas's loyalty actually lies, namely not with the Palestinian people. Here's an example. Hamas is more loyal to Iran's mullah leadership than it is to its own Palestinian people. It is a despicable group that fires rockets from its own hospitals and schools to get Israel to bomb them so it can exploit dead Palestinian children to get the world's sympathy. Hamas is no more loyal to the Palestinian people than the Islamic Republic of Iran is to the Iranian people. He later goes on to refer to their religious motives for wanting to wipe out the Israelis and the fact that Hamas doesn't allow Palestinian civilians access to the few bomb shelters they've actually built. As for the Israeli side, Ali lays out a couple of ways in which Benjamin Netanyahu has damaged Israel's security, namely undercutting the peace process between Israel and the Palestinians in a way that represents a serious long-term threat to Israel's status as a Jewish democracy, undercutting Israel's bipartisan support in the United States, and undercutting national unity with his creepy, undemocratic power grabs. The thread also points out the often ignored role Egypt plays whenever there's a conflict between Israel and Gaza, namely shutting down their own border with the Gaza Strip and thus preventing humanitarian aid from getting in or civilians from getting out. But here is what I think possibly the most important part of this thread for those trying to understand what's going on at the macro level of this conflict. Right now, here's the way to think about this. You're a kid in school and another kid with a legitimate grievance against your grandparents that wasn't your fault or his is coming at you to beat you up. You manage to subdue him. You're sitting on top of him now, your hands pinning his wrists to the ground. Let me go, he says. I don't want to fight, you say. If I let you go, do you promise not to hit me? But he's silent. If you let him go, he punches you out. But if you don't let him go, you're a bully forcing yourself on this younger, poorer kid. It's hopelessly deadlocked. Just a little aside here. I am straight up embarrassed by how good that take is. I've spent years trying to find a way of boiling this conflict down to the basics for people who haven't been paying like quite as obsessive an amount of attention to it as I have. And also, I'm somebody who's like, almost incapable of explaining things without resorting immediately to metaphor and analogy, and yet I've never come up with anything in the same universe as how good that is as a metaphor for where we are right now. Concluding his thread, and here I'll quote Ali directly again, it's been 75 years, and several generations of people have been born in this land on both sides. You may have your opinion about the mistakes their grandparents and great-grandparents made, but none of the people who live there today have any other place to call home. Okay, so that's where the conflict stands. And now this horrible attack has happened. I've been asked by a couple of people in the wake of all of this, what's going to happen now? Well, obviously I can only speculate, but some things at least are pretty clear. Although before I really answer that question, I should throw in one uh, more bit of context besides everything else I've already talked about and brought in. And believe me, you have no idea how much I'm restraining myself here from like going off on tangents about the Six-Day War or the Balfour Declaration or whatever. But before I like take a stab at answering that question of what I think is going to happen now, there is one more thing that I do need to touch on. I spoke briefly earlier about the number of Israelis who died in the attack and then pivoted pretty quickly to the point about the horrific, like sociopathic way in which they were killed. 
But I do need to come back to that overall number in terms of like what this attack has meant to Israel. So as, as of the time I'm recording this, I think, yeah, around somewhere around 1,300 Israeli civilians and some folks from other countries who were visiting Israel have been killed. And that's terrible on its own. Uh, but that uh, number takes on an, an even bigger significance when thought of in a certain context. So I've heard this attack being referred to as Israel's 9-11. I'm not sure how I feel about that analogy for a couple of reasons, but let's use it to make one point here. So on 9-11, about 3,000 Americans were murdered by Al-Qaeda. Unlike the U.S., though, Israel is a very small, very tight-knit country. In real terms, based on population, the number of Israelis murdered in this attack is as though America suffered an attack in which something like 45,000 people were killed. Now, let's just remember, the U.S. went absolutely insane after 9-11. I mean, some of its responses were obviously necessary and justified, others, well, not so much, to put it mildly. This attack, as I've outlined, is worse in a lot of ways for Israel than 9-11 was for the U.S., especially for a country which was born out of the ashes of the Holocaust, a memory that is still very much alive. I mean, it's reasonable that Israel would go after Hamas after this attack. Nobody expected the U.S. to just not do anything after 9-11. Nobody can reasonably expect Israel to not do everything in its power to destroy Hamas now. And despite some, like, really disgusting displays of celebration over the attack we've seen in some quarters, including on the streets of some western cities where demonstrators have been on camera chanting a combination of Allahu Akbar and gas the Jews, well, despite that, or besides that, there has been quite a bit of solidarity with Israel from democratic governments in the face of what just happened. But let's see how long that lasts. As of a couple of minutes ago, the Israelis are asking the UN to help move people in the north of Gaza toward the south, like, right now. So, now might also be a good time for Egypt to start being a little bit less rigid about their border and maybe thinking about some humanitarian corridors. As Ali Rizvi pointed out, in a lot of ways, a response from Israel resulting in civilian casualties, since Hamas uses the entire population of Gaza as a shield, was Hamas's goal all along. But that still doesn't mean that Israel can just not do anything. It's also worth noting, as it's often skipped over, that Israel does take pretty extraordinary measures to avoid civilian casualties. They'll usually send mass text messages in Arabic to neighborhoods they're about to attack, warning civilians to leave. And then they'll usually also drop basically a lead projectile onto the roof of a building that they're about to attack 15 minutes beforehand, uh, before they actually do, so as to warn civilians to, to try to get out. Despite this, yes, tragically, there will certainly be civilian casualties. It's been pretty clear that Benjamin Netanyahu's strategy vis-a-vis -vis Hamas has been to effectively let them have the Gaza Strip and just let the Palestinian citizens of Gaza suffer the consequences of being ruled by a terrorist organization. That way he, Netanyahu, gets to demagogue the security threat coming from the jihadists next door in Gaza and hold what happened in Gaza up when they pulled out the occupation as an excuse to not do anything like that in the West Bank, but ultimately mostly just wall off and ignore Gaza and instead devote his attention to messing around in the West Bank as per the desires of his extreme right supporters. But obviously that's not going to work anymore. I actually have seen some speculation that Hamas maybe didn't really expect this attack to be quite as successful as it was. This attack might have been, as Graham Wood put it in The Atlantic, catastrophic success, which will now inevitably lead to Hamas's downfall. Whatever the case, obviously Israel can't just move on without taking the fight to Hamas any more than the U.S. could simply let bin Laden go after 9-11. Which means that Israel will almost certainly have to invade the Gaza Strip in order to root out Hamas which they'll probably do successfully, although it'll come at terrible losses for both Israeli troops and Palestinian civilians. I should also mention, since I've forgotten to up until now, that this will also be massively complicated by the fact that Hamas now has hundreds of hostages that they just captured in this raid, and they're threatening to execute them on live TV under certain circumstances. But in spite of that, my guess is Israel invades the Gaza Strip and manages to largely root out Hamas, at least what's left of Hamas now that their upper echelons have almost certainly already fled to Qatar. But then what? Well, one idea I heard floated by Michael Oren, the former Israeli ambassador to the U.S., was the idea of Israel withdrawing from the Strip in favor of some sort of peacekeeping force made up of the soldiers of a couple of different Arab countries with whom Israel has moved to normalize relations. And that... Well, that, I think, could be a very, very interesting idea. 
the involvement of other Arab countries that are no longer openly hostile to Israel, but have at least some credibility with the Palestinians, well, seems to me to be just about the only path to peace that I can see at this point. Since we're talking about the broader region now, that leads me to another question that somebody asked me this week. Hi, Alan. What is the possibility of this situation blowing up into a, some sort of broader regional conflict? So, just by way of context here, the Iranian government is a direct sponsor of both Hamas and the much larger, much scarier terrorist organization Hezbollah, which basically owns a chunk of southern Lebanon and has also been very active in Syria. Unlike Hamas, Hezbollah is Shia, which aligns them with Syria's brutal dictator Bashar al-Assad. Also, the Iranian government has got to be very nervous about the fact that Israel has been quite openly moving with U.S. support toward normalizing relations with the Saudis, as they have over time with Egypt, Jordan, Morocco, Bahrain, the UAE, a couple others, I think. But Saudi Arabia would be the big one. And this is a very scary prospect for Iran, so there's speculation that Iran basically put Hamas up to this in order to create chaos and try to scuttle the deal. Now, if that's the case, obviously there's a huge worry that Iran's much more frightening proxy, Hezbollah, could basically build on Hamas's momentum by attacking Israel from the north. This would probably be part of the reason that the U.S. has sent at least one, and I think now a second, carrier battle group to the eastern Mediterranean as a deterrent. So the thing is, when I was first asked this question this week of whether I thought this might blow up into a broader regional conflict, so I got asked this literally an hour after I started hearing from friends in the north of Israel that air raid sirens were going off there, and there were reports of jihadists breaking through the northern border, and also there was like some artillery fire exchanged, so... At that point, I figured, yeah, looks like Hezbollah's going to get in the game, which would basically require Israel to repeat 2006 and invade southern Lebanon at the same time they're trying to uproot Hamas from the Gaza Strip, which would be a lot. <laughs> and also, I think, would almost certainly bring the U.S. into the conflict as well. But then things seem to have died down. A couple of days have passed since the initial attack by Hamas, and more than a day has passed since things seem to be heating up in the north, and no major attack has materialized. So, maybe it was just a rogue element within Hezbollah, or maybe Hezbollah got cold feet, maybe those carrier battle groups scared them off. The thing is, if you want to inflict a serious defeat on Israel from a military standpoint, the way to do it is basically to do it really quickly. As Graham Wood put it in that Atlantic article I mentioned earlier, Israel tends to start wars badly and end them well, because a huge part of their strength is in their reserve forces, which take a few days to get mobilized. I mean, take the example we're dealing with right now. On Saturday, Israel got caught flat-footed, with tragic results. But in just a few days since then, I think now more than 300,000 fully trained Israelis are in uniform, armed, and ready to go. The longer Hezbollah waits, the harder it will be for them to do any real damage. So. At this point, and I desperately hope I'm right, I think the chances for a larger regional war are actually a lot lower than they were just a day or two ago. The final question then is, what happens when and if definitive proof emerges that the vicious theocrats that run Iran were ultimately behind the worst slaughter of Jews on any single day since the Holocaust? Well, hard to say. I personally don't think that the Iranian regime wants a full-scale war with Israel, because that would certainly bring in the U.S. Indirect attacks through their terrorist proxies seem to be about as far as the mullahs tend to want to go. That is, at least until they have a nuclear weapon, which would totally upend the whole Middle East calculus, and which is why that can simply never be allowed to happen. Additionally, unless they're attacked first, I think if the regime tried to launch an open war with Israel in the United States, the Iranian people simply would not stand for it. The government there is already on shaky ground after the huge protests last summer. Also, the Iranian people really don't seem to appreciate having a bunch of resources that they desperately need redirected toward the adventures of the regime's terrorist proxies Hezbollah and Hamas. The great irony of this whole tension between Israel and Iran, at the same time as Israel is strengthening ties with certain Arab governments, is that the Iranian people, I think as a whole, are actually a lot less anti-Israel and anti-Western than the average person in most Arab states. I mean, sure, the regime does you know, try a lot of things to gin up anti-Israel and anti-U.S. hatred in Iran. Like, they make school kids chant, death to America, death to Israel, all the time. But, well, speaking of political chants, just the other day at a hugely important soccer game in Tehran, 
Some regime supporters brought out Palestinian flags and tried to get the crowd all riled up celebrating the attack on Israel. But instead, this happened. I got it confirmed from a dear Iranian friend and one-time guest on this very show from back in episode 30. Yes, that is the crowd in that soccer stadium in the capital of Iran, ignoring an attempt by the regime to get them to engage in the usual two minutes hate and instead chanting, and I quote, take that Palestinian flag and shove it up your ass, unquote. Swear to God that's real. Now, in all seriousness, I'm not endorsing that sentiment. I very much mean it when I say that I'm deeply sympathetic to the plight of individual Palestinians. I want to see both their lives improved and an independent Palestinian state. But you gotta admit, it is kind of hilarious to hear this crowd of Iranian soccer fans completely reject their totalitarian theocratic government's attempt to get them to celebrate the murder of Israelis, as did their supreme leader in a series of gross, bloodthirsty tweets giggling over a video of the kids at the music festival being shot in the back a couple days ago. Back to the original point about the likelihood of a broader regional war. From the Israeli standpoint, I don't think they'd want to start a war with Iran right now either. The Gaza operation on its own is going to be tragically costly, so I doubt they'd want to extend further. Additionally, they do clearly seem to want this deal with the Saudis. And yes, the Saudis do hate the Iranians, but A... There seems to have been a slight thaw this week, with Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed Bonesaw bin Salman hopping on the phone with the Iranian puppet President Ibrahim Raisi, and B, well, people don't tend to want to form an alliance with you when it looks like you're on the edge of starting a war which could drag them in, which gives the Israelis another reason to not want one in service to the broader goal of normalization with the Saudis. So, yeah, I don't know. That's my best guess as to what might happen now as of the very wee hours of the morning on October 13th. I guess I'll just wrap up this episode by saying this, this thing between the Israelis and the Palestinians is almost certainly the most intractable conflict on Earth. It's unbelievably hard. What really ought to be less hard is having at least some humanity toward the innocent regular people caught in the middle. I propose, for example, the following as easy positions that decent people should be able to hold all at the same time. Hamas's brutal and deliberate mass rape, mass kidnapping, and mass slaughter of Israeli civilians last weekend was pure evil, nothing whatsoever justifies it, and celebrating it as some sort of like, resistance victory is just wrong. The Israeli government should do more to improve the lives of those under its charge, including and especially the Palestinians, who have very legitimate grievances and ultimately should be independent from Israeli control. It is perfectly legitimate to criticize the Israeli government and the way it's handled the Palestinians, and also Israel has a legitimate right to exist peacefully. Using a civilian population and hostages as human shields is as reprehensible as it is cowardly, and those who do so are ultimately guilty for whatever happens to the innocent people they put in that position. And the Israelis should do every conceivable thing in their power to minimize civilian casualties and should follow the laws of war even if a military action is justified in principle. Now, in practice, the details of some of those ideas will be incredibly difficult. But as principles, my god, I hope most of us can at least agree on that. In the meantime, I join everyone else who's doing so in mourning the tragic loss of Israelis in the worst attack against Jews since the Holocaust, and the inevitable and also tragic loss of Palestinian civilians that will result, and already are resulting, from Hamas's senseless attack. That's it for this episode of OK Talks. If you like the show and want to make sure not to miss the next episode, please be sure to follow on whatever platform you listen or shoot me an email at oktalkspodcast at gmail.com to be added to the email list. Also, please do feel free to reach out if you have ideas for the show, a topic you want me to cover, somebody you think I ought to have on. I really did appreciate getting some questions this week. I can't promise I'll always be able to answer them or very quickly, but I'm serious. I'd love to hear from you. oktalkspodcast at gmail.com. If you really want to do me a solid, please do go ahead and share the show with anybody you think might get something out of it. To anybody who already has, thanks. To any who will, thanks in advance. Thanks as always to Nate Wright for having designed the podcast artwork and to everyone else for listening. Music.